Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of IGN Unfiltered. I'm Ryan McCaffrey and I am pleased to be joined by Josh Sawyer. He is a longtime <laughs> RPG designer at uh, Obsidian, previous to that uh, Black Isle. Uh, of course, every month here on Unfiltered, we sit down with the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry. And uh, Josh, you certainly qualify. Oh, thank you. I'm really stoked <laughs> to have you here. Uh, Glad to be here. You've got a, a wonderful resume, which I want to explore. But I want to start with uh, just your sort of background, because it's, it's not necessarily the prototypical game designer background. Uh, you were a history major at Lawrence University uh, in Wisconsin. So I guess I'm just sort of curious, what, what's your favorite era of, era of history and, and sort of and or your expertise? Yeah, I would say, <clears throat> I don't know if there is a typical way to becoming a game designer anymore. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, like, if there ever was, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I actually originally went to school for vocal performance. I went to the Lawrence Conservatory of Music, and I was a really bad student. And um, I realized that I liked singing, but I didn't really want to be a musician. Um, I've always loved history. So uh, yeah, I pursued a degree in history. I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do with it. I just yeah. knew that I loved it. And I really enjoy uh, early modern history, Renaissance history, uh, also the history of religion, the history of magic, um, both in that era and in other eras as well. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so what was, I, I suspect with, with that, the vocal performance and then history that you weren't originally thinking, well, I'm gonna, use those to get into the video game world. So what, what was sort of your original uh, career, career projections and desires? Oh, geez. I mean, like, when I first went to college I, and was in the Conservatory of Music, I thought that I was going to perform in musicals. I was going to be a professional actor and singer. Yeah. And uh, I didn't really think that through. And then when I went over to get a history degree, I did eventually get a minor in theater as well, but I didn't have a well-formed plan for what I was really gonna do with those degrees. Like I said, I just knew that I really enjoyed them. I thought maybe I could do dramaturgical work for theater or for film, maybe, yeah. but I didn't really make any grand efforts towards that. I was really more focused, in my free time, I was really more focused on playing games, designing games in my free time. Uh, if anything, I thought that I would get into tabletop design hmm. because I was from Wisconsin, which is where TSR is from. Oh, cool. And uh, I had interacted with some of the folks at TSR. I'd gone to Gen Con, Winter Fantasy, stuff like that. And so that seemed like a much more attainable route for me. Um, and even though I loved computer games, my heart at that time, at least, was really in tabletop games. And I was already designing my own tabletop games just to play with my friends. So if anything, that's what I thought I was gonna do. But honestly, when I was about to graduate, what I was planning on doing is uh, becoming an apprentice at a tattoo parlor. Um, because even before I got into music, my father is, a, he's a bronze sculptor and an illustrator. Oh, wow. And I became really interested in illustration. I loved all the fantasy art that I saw from TSR and, and other companies. And so that's what I was interested in. But, uh, and obviously I have lots of ink. <laughs> um, so I was interested in becoming a tattoo apprentice in part because I really just didn't know what else I could do with my, my degree. Um, but I had taught myself web design in college. I taught myself HTML, I taught myself uh, Flash animation, which at that time was Flash 3. So it's, it's Flash isn't even Flash anymore. Well, it's, yeah, it was the late 90s at the time, right? Uh, yeah, and, uh, and there were actually a surprisingly small number of people that, that knew Flash, and a friend of mine, Michael, told me, hey, there's a, a company in California that is hiring uh, a web designer. Yeah, Black Isle. It was Black Isle, and I was like, oh, I know Black Isle from Fallout. And he's like, yeah, they're, they're hiring a web designer for uh, a secret game. At that time, it was secret, and I applied, and I wrote a four-page cover letter, which I don't recommend that anyone does, because I just <laughs> I just rambled on and on about my opinion yeah, of one like- One page, right? One I, page. Yeah, <laughs> where, where RPGs were going, and all this other crazy stuff that no one asked me to do, and you really shouldn't do, but- um, I, I wound up getting the job as uh, the webmaster for what turned out to be Planescape Torment. So that that was my very weird and unlikely route into the industry as I graduated from college and actually, uh, yeah, as of three days ago, it will be, I've been in California for 18 years. Nice. So. But uh, so it's, it sounds to me like you're kind of a, even as a young adult, very much kind of a renaissance man between vocal performance and history and, and some tattoo might, apprenticeship. And some might say dilettante, <laughs> some might say renaissance man. 
I mean, I was interested in lots of different things. And it's uh, healthy. That's good. Yeah, and I well, I mean, usually when I get into something, I get really passionate about it, and I I really fixate on sort of pursuing it uh, until it appears that I I'm either stymied in some way, like illustration. I'm I'm colorblind, and that makes painting pretty frustrating and difficult. Uh, and then yeah, just just certain other things that might present roadblocks. Then I might look at something else and pursue that for a while. So. Uh, I think that it's helped me in the long run, even though in the short term, it really looked like, <laughs> you know, I was just kind of bouncing around to a variety of things in, a, in an unproductive way. Were your parents very supportive at that time when, you know, you're first you, you want to do one thing, then you're going to, towards another? Are they, are they pulling their hair out or are they just like, however we can help you, Josh, we want to make sure we do that? My, uh, my parents are, have always been extremely supportive of me. Um, like I said, my father is a freelance bronze sculptor and which is not the easiest gig in, in Southern Wisconsin. There's not a huge market <laughs> for bronze sculpture there. Um, and I think his view, I mean, I think my parents have always been really supportive of me. They've always expressed a lot of, of pride in, in the work that I do, whatever form that has taken. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously they don't, they never wanted to see me sort of struggling, but they also wanted me to be happy and pursue the things that made me happy. So even if at times they showed concern, it was always, uh, it was never a disapproving sort of concern. It was like a general concern for my well-being. So I, I have to give them a lot of credit for supporting me all throughout high school and college and beyond. I'm guessing mm -hmm. you were uh, you were the DM a lot in in uh, any tabletop D and D or the or, or the like. You seem, seemed I, like the person that was you'd be you'd be in there wanting to craft and guide the experience for your fellow players? Well, I mean, I, I was a lot, but I enjoyed playing just as much as DMing. So whether it was in high school or in college, uh, I did take a lot of time prepping games and running games, but uh, just as much I loved sitting in on other people's games. Uh, I have a friend from college, J.R. Strandberg, who designed his own uh, tabletop role playing, playing game system, and I love playing in that and giving him feedback. Because I think the player perspective is something that's extremely important, and it's something that I, I hope I've brought over into my computer design. Yeah. Um, it's kind of serendipitous that you're such a big RPG guy, even, if, even in the tabletop form, but computer games as well, and, and the, the webmaster gig, the, the web design gig ends up being at Black Isle yes. of all studios. <laughs> yes, very, very lucky. I mean, I have to say that really, um, you know, people always like to say like, well, hard work will get you, you know, wherever, but like there are tons of people that work hard and they never get a break. And for me, I really feel like I have benefited immensely from people that are very supportive of me uh, and just a lot of good fortune along the way. It does, luck does help, doesn't it? Uh, it's critical, <laughs> I would say. Uh, so how do, how do you go from web designer at Black Isle to three years later, you're shipping Icewind Dale 2 as the lead designer? Is, uh, does, does Fergus or someone else on the team have to give you a chance? Are you lobbying for, for design opportunities? Kind of how to, I'm curious of how you get from point A to point B there. Nonstop harassment is part of it. Um, so I worked, I worked pretty closely with the development team on Planescape Torment to make sure that the site was really representing what they were making as yeah. well as I could. So whether it was you know talking to Tim Donnelly, the art lead, about uh, you know, getting art uh, represented on the website as well as we could, or talking to Chris Avalone or Colin McComb about, you know, the lore updates and things like that. I really wanted to, I'm really passionate about this stuff. So I really wanted to make sure that not only the Planescape setting was really well represented, but also the specific game of Planescape Torment that the developers were making was really well supported. Uh, I think also during that time, because of the conversations I was having with designers, they recognized that I knew Dungeons and Dragons really thoroughly. Yeah. Um, and I kept talking to Fergus and saying like, I'd really love to do some design work on, on something. And you know, it's really a passion of mine. I'm really, I, I know Forgotten Realms really well. I know second edition D&D really well. They were starting to spin up Icewind Dale, the first one. Mm -hmm. And you know, Fergus was saying like, there's not like, we got a lot of work for you to do that's web work. And, you know, we have enough designers on Icewind Dale, so not right now, but eventually a position did open up and he said, okay, you can come over and you can do uh, work as a junior designer on Icewind Dale. And I, I just, I and the rest of the juniors on that team, because it was really a team of juniors, uh, we worked, we just worked really hard. We were really passionate uh, about uh, what we wanted to do. 
And when it came time to look at doing Icewind Dale 2, that was, I don't want to say it was really toward the very end of Black Isle, but it was when Interplay, our parent company, was in a lot of trouble. And uh, I knew Icewind Dale very thoroughly, and it was just me and a few other people that were really like maybe key for doing it, for being the lead on that. Yeah. And I just took the responsibility for it. Um, and uh, yeah, we just, we did what we had to do to get it done. <laughs> so what'd you, what, what do you think is the, the biggest thing you learned about the difference between designing tabletop games and designing computer games? Oh, there's a lot of differences. I think that the pace of a computer game is completely different than the pace of a tabletop game. Uh, the improvisational elements of a tabletop game are extremely hard to emulate in a, in a computer game. So in a computer game, a combat that lasts in real time maybe 30 seconds and even with pausing maybe takes like a minute or yeah. a minute and a half, in a tabletop game that might be a half hour combat. Hmm. And so when you think about the balance of those things and like what you're doing moment to moment and what the player is paying attention to, there are big differences there. I think also in making the Infinity Engine games, we made games where you control a whole party. You know, there are differences between Baldur's Gate or for example, Pillars of Eternity, where you make a single character and then companions join you yeah. versus Icewind Dale where you make a whole party. But the fact that you're controlling every single character simultaneously and pausing, that's a very different feeling from when you're playing in a tabletop game and it's much, the pacing is much slower, you can take more time, you can talk to each other, you can look things up in books. Uh, it's just the whole process is paced very differently and the experience is a lot different. Um, I think my goal with a lot of the games that we've made that are trying to capture the spirit of tabletop gaming is to try to, try to bring forward some of the player facing sort of improvisational stuff, whether it's like dialogue options, being able to, you know, ally with different factions, double cross people, you know, kill every NPC in the world and still complete the quest. Um, those are the sorts of things that um, I think are really cool in a tabletop game. And if you really make, a, make it a priority to make those part of the games that you're doing, you can do it. But there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make to do how that. About, <laughs> how about any, uh, did you really notice any big similarities between tabletop stuff that you designed and that was like directly applicable to designing computer games? Well, I mean, I think that one of the things that still has stayed with me is whether you're making a tabletop role-playing game or a CRPG, there is a, there's a fantasy that you're trying to fulfill for the player. You're trying to, and it's, it's a diverse set of fantasies, and I think that's an important thing to think about. If you are playing a game where you are a singular character. Even a role-playing game, you know, like let's say The Witcher or Deus Ex, where you're Adam Jensen, you're Geralt, uh, those are sort of codified characters that are kind of who they are, and they have a range of expression, but it is a sort of limited range of expression. Yeah. Tabletop games are about creating one of many, many possible characters, and the more you as a DM or as a designer try to constrain what the player can do and limit their role-playing opportunities or their ability to express themselves, the less enjoyable it really feels. The more you try to enable and support that and let the player say, I'm just gonna smack this NPC in the face or I'm gonna like <laughs> bust out of here or I'm gonna like, I'm gonna beat the impossible fight. The more that you say, you know what, I'm gonna let you do that and we'll make the story work for it. I think players really appreciate that stuff. And so that's, whether it's, whether it's the more tabletop light games, like the Infinity Engine games, or something like Fall at New Vegas, that's a spirit that I really try to embrace and get the designers to embrace in how they design things. Well, speaking of Fallout, uh, at, the, at the end of your time at Black Isle, and in fact, near the end of Black Isle itself, you were working on the original version of Fallout 3. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what that game was? Sure. Uh, I will say that at the beginning of that project, I was just the lead uh, system designer. Uh, Chris Avalon was the lead designer. He had been working on, he had a huge Bible full of ideas. I mean, he's a very prolific writer. He writes down everything he thinks about. Um, and he had tons of, of great ideas for characters and quests and like and locations that were really awesome. And so we were trying to sort of like, not compress it, but like thin it out. Because there were so many ideas. We're like, okay, well, what are the, what are the elements of this that are really going to congeal into a really cool central through line? And then what are the sort of outside side quests and you know, companions and things like that that we can, we can develop? 
And, but it was very hard. It was a very stressful time because of the state that Interplay was in. We were losing a lot of people. Okay. And uh, you know, the owners at, that eventually became Obsidian, uh, they, were, they were already looking and thinking like, we, we really got to get out of here because it, we were very passionate about making Fallout 3. And uh, even against reason, we were like, we were looking around and we realized like, there is no way realistically that we're gonna get this done, but we have to try as hard as we can to make something great. And so uh, after uh, Chris left with uh, the other folks to form Obsidian, mm -hmm. I stayed behind with some other people who were like, we, we, gotta, we gotta get through this demo phase and, and show higher management and interplay that this, this game is really worth making. And we just never really got support for it. And so it was very frustrating because um, I, I'm not gonna say that the pre-production process of Fallout, of Fallout 3 or Van Buren was without problems, but we made some really cool stuff, and I think that there was a lot of promise in, in the game there. It was just, Interplay was not in a state where they could really support full development of it, so it was, it was pretty tragic. Does it eat at you at all that that project was never able to be finished? I mean, it would eat at me a lot more if I hadn't been able to make New Vegas, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, there, there's, yeah, there were a lot of cool things, I think, in, in the technology, and, and one of the things that, that I was recently talking to someone else uh, in an interview where th this style of game, the isometric role-playing game, whether you're controlling a single character or a party of characters, the fans never left that style of game. Publishers left that style That's of game. That's true, it's a good point. And it was a very frustrating thing to see, to have publishers tell us that no one wants these games when we have a huge audience of fans, maybe not as huge as the audiences that they wanted, <laughs> But the thing is, like, I've, the thing is, I've always been perfectly content to make games that are mere million sellers. Right. Which, you know, a now nice, that... healthy ceiling. Yeah, like, now that seems mm -hmm. ridiculous because there are games that sell... T I mean, Fallout New Vegas has sold, you know, something like 12 min million units or something like that to date. And so a million units seems like nothing. But, like, if the budget is small and the team is small, you can make a really awesome game that you have a very passionate fan base that's willing to play it. So it was a very frustrating experience to see the publishing world just sort of leave that behind when we were totally willing to keep making those games and fans were you know totally willing to right, keep they, playing they them. they want the high ceiling yes y you were you were looking at a lower ceiling but a higher floor yes right and yeah and, I, which of course now you've proven at obsidian we'll get to that later but that's exactly sure. more or less what you guys are doing now yeah. uh so uh, of course i'm curious if uh well, you have to have played Bethesda's Fallout 3 that ultimately sure. came out because you did New Vegas. What did you think of Bethesda's game when you finally played it? Obviously, completely different first person, whole, you know. Of course, but, yeah. But what, what were your thoughts on that when that game came out? Well, I mean, I played about 160 hours of it. A little bit. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, I wanted to make sure that I really exhausted like everything in the game. And I think that one thing that Bethesda does, I mean, they, they sort of mastered the art of exploration. <laughs> And whether it's exploring uh, an, a sort of outer world or an individual environment, like a, a, close, a, a smaller dungeon area, they are really, really good about um, continually like encouraging the player to sort of keep going and keep exploring. One of the first things that I think Chris Avalon noted about how their world was set up is if you play Fallout 3, when you're at a location, if you look around, there are always at least three landmarks hmm. that you can see from that location. So when you're done with something and you're like, well, I'm done with that, if you just turn your head in any direction, you're gonna see another thing that you can go to. And when you get to that thing and you look around, there's another thing you can go to. And so I really think that, um, you know, the experience they had working on the Elder Scrolls games really helped them build out the Capital Wasteland into this, into this like sort of never ending exploration extravaganza where there was always some like new thing to find and explore and discover. And that was something when we looked at um, when we looked at making Fallout New Vegas, their style of world building is something that we really tried to embrace and emulate. We didn't necessarily do as good of a job, but I think that's the one thing that they really have a great strength in, and I think it's one of the reasons why people, whether it's the Elder Scrolls games or the Fallout games, that they really love. What did, when you were when you put 160 hours into Fallout 3, did you know yet that you'd be making New Vegas? Yes, so you, I believe you, so. You went in not so much as. Uh, just a fan, but with an eye towards another project. Yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember the exact timeline. I think I might have played like some of it for a while, and then once it was looking like we were going to make New Vegas, I'm like, okay, now I have to just completely exhaust everything in this game to see where it takes me. So, uh, 
backing up a little bit, you ended up leaving Black Isle. Uh, you did stick around, but then two weeks before it closed down, yes, uh, you you <laughs> headed for the door. So you you obviously, as you've already pointed out, you, you saw the writing on the wall. Um, it, <laughs> is that just what sort of emotionally are you going through at that point? Like, is it just you're just resigned to the fact that all right, this is over? There's or or is it just like a sense of uh, unfinished business like what how is how is that like for you as a as a, especially in the middle of a, of a project like Van Buren yeah I would say that I would say that I mean it was disappointing but I felt like I got to I got to make some dream games at Obsidian or I'm sorry I got to make some dream games at Black Isle and uh, it was a lot of fun I got to make Icewind Dale 1 I got to make Icewind Dale 2 and I knew that really like without a lot of the key people and without the support of Interplay, there's no way that that Van Buren would have turned out well. So, I mean, I was disappointed, but I was kind of like, I don't, I, I can't see a good way out of this. So it just made sense to leave for, for everyone's benefit. Is it, is, uh, is it for the best then, given what you're saying that, that Van Buren never ended up shipping? Oh, given, given the way things were going, yes, I would say so. Because we just we had so many people leaving and we had so little support. If it were to eventually have come out, I'm sure it would have been under great duress and I don't think it would have been a healthy project. Right. Um, so let's see. Uh, you, I think you had, a, you had a... Did you have a brief stop at Midway after, uh, after I did. Black Isle? Yeah, I went, down to, I went down to Midway, San Diego for about a year and a half. And you were working on a on a Gauntlet game, were you not? Yes, I was working on Gauntlet Seven Sorrows. Yeah, which uh, you know, not not a terrible game. I feel like not a lot of people talk about it anymore. It's uh, there. I mean, there have been a few attempts at sort of re revitalizing and reviving Gauntlet, but uh, what what did you find? You know, because this is now Black Isle was the only professional yeah. game development home you had known. How are things different for you uh, at Midway? Like just seeing another another perspective in the industry well i mean it was interesting because midway san diego was uh you know pretty far removed from midway chicago which is really where everything was headquartered and there wasn't a lot of really clear and regular communication between the two studios um at black isle we felt like a very core part of interplay and a very important and integral part of interplay at Midway, the San Diego studio felt like uh, a company and a team and a studio that really needed to always prove itself in everything that, that we were doing. And uh, Midway was also going through a lot of financial problems at the True. time. And, yeah. and it wound up, that project wound up being under a huge amount of pressure to come out by a specific date. And that was when I was like, look, I've already been through this sort of experience before. I don't, I, I don't want to just push things out to make a date. Like that's not, that's not what my career aspirations are. And I have a lot of respect for the people that I worked with, but I, I just didn't see it working out very well in the end. So you ended up, uh, then you, you get to Obsidian, you link up with the old crew uh, and you go to work as the lead designer on Neverwinter Nights 2. So uh, did, did, it, did that sort of feel like coming home to you or did it still manage to feel like a new thing? Well, it did feel like a new thing because even though there were a lot of people from Black Isle at Obsidian, they had already gone through a full development cycle prior to me getting there. So they had already made Nice to the Old Republic 2. And when I came there and started working on Neverwinter Nights 2, a lot of the senior people there were people I'd never worked with before. And so, and, and then a lot of the juniors were just, they're brand new. They were just out of school or they had come from other places with a little bit of experience. So in some ways it was familiar, but it was also oddly unfamiliar because, um, just kind of the landscape of things had, had changed. And I was coming in in the middle of a project. And I, I didn't come in as the lead, I came in as a senior designer. So uh, it was kind of weird for a while. I, I don't think I was really syncing well with what was going on in the team. And so I went to work on another project at Obsidian for a while with just a small sort of starter team. And it wasn't until the lead designer, Ferret Bodwin, left that then Fergus asked me to come back over onto the team as the as the lead designer to to finish it up. And uh, of course, Neverwinter Nights too did end up coming out, and it's very well liked to this day. Is that do, do you when it when it when your first project there at Obsidian ships then and it's well received? Do you do you is it sort of a sense of relief or is it or is it 
uh, energizing or kind of what's what's the sense for you and, and your career trajectory after having been through the Black <laughs> Isle closure and then maybe not the greatest experience at Midway San Diego? Well, I mean, I think it was relief because Neverwinter 2 was in a difficult place for a long time. And there were a lot of people working a lot of hours on that game. And especially after KOTOR 2 had a reputation for being unfinished. And so I was really concerned. I was like, look, we, you know, that was the first game that the studio made, uh, Neverwinter 2. Whatever it is when it comes out, like it needs to be as strong as it can be. And obviously there are always practical limitations to how much money we get sure. and how much time we have and everything like that. But I was just relieved that we were able to get it in, in pretty decent shape before it, it shipped. So for me, I, I never considered Neverwinter 2 really like my project. I considered it my responsibility to, to make sure that all the hard work that the team had done was as well represented as it could be in the final product. So the, uh, of course, the Interplay, or Interplay, Black Isle and, and even now at Obsidian, uh, the projects are famously codenamed after ex-presidents. Is that, uh, and, and you, cause you're credited with, with starting that. I take it that comes from your history background? No, it really was just that, um, so at Black Isle it was presidents, at Obsidian it's states in order of incorporation into the union. <laughs> and that idea I think came from Chris Parker, one of the owners at Obsidian. But the basic idea was just that Irvine had, and still has, a fair number of different video game developers in it. And we go out to lunch, we go out to dinner. We yeah, have, Blizzard's down there. Well, Blizzard is very close to us. <laughs> and. I was concerned that if we were talk, well, there are two concerns that I have. One is if we if we talk about things with a sort of definite name in public, then it makes it easier for people to overhear what we're talking about. Right. The other is that if we try to call something, if we try to call a project by a name that seems like it might be possibly the real name, then that will become the real name. And so what I what I thought would be better is just give them a code name that absolutely has nothing to do with what it is, whether it's a president's name or a state's name. Like for example, uh, Dead Fire is Louisiana, and that way there's no real attachment to it. It's just it's just the working name of the project yeah. to help differentiate it from other things. And then when you get around to the time to give it its real name, then you can have that conversation without the baggage of having called it something else for two years or something. Um, and then we still do wind up just naturally talking about projects as those code names. So when we go out and have lunch or whatever, and we talk about Ohio or Louisiana or Indiana, those are just sort of like the natural way we talk about them. So there's very little danger that uh, a real name is going to slip out in public. So clearly uh, Microsoft didn't follow that system because the, the <clears throat> direct Xbox, Xbox ended up just sticking. The code name <laughs> just ended up sticking. Although it's kind of worked out for them. Yeah, and I fine. mean, although I will say that later on when we were working with Microsoft, they were using code names for, <laughs> for stuff. So I'm like, okay, well, this is clearly working a little bit better. Well, you guys had uh, talked to Fergus when he was here about the, uh, the game that, that was Canto, was supposed to be a 360 launch title that, yeah. that never saw the light of day. That sounded like a unfortunate situation. Yeah, actually that wasn't a three, that was a uh, Xbox One That's what, sorry, yeah. Yeah, my memory is de deceiving me here. Um, so heading into Fallout New Vegas now, you're the lead designer. Uh, you've talked a little bit about the sense of discovery and exploration that Bethesda's really good at. What were your goals for the New Vegas project? And, and in hindsight, how close do you feel you came to achieving all of them? Well, I mean, I had a number of goals. One was I wanted to look at uh, the systems that were in the game and try to sort of refine them, whether it was the special system, the skill system, things like that. I wanted to look at perks and sort of refine that list and make them feel more distinct from each other. Um, remove a lot of the, the perks that were more like skill bonus sort of related things. Focus more on things that gave individual gameplay benefits. I also, from a gameplay perspective, uh, wanted to really make the choices the player made throughout the course of the game feel like they had a lot more impact from moment to moment and in the long term. And I conceived of the basic plot structure, which is, I'm sorry, I should back up a little bit. I believe Chris Avalone thought of the, the sort of uh, initial element of Fallout New Vegas, which is you get shot in the head and dropped in a shallow grave in the desert and you're left there and you, you survive. 
and which seems like a very Vegasy sort of sort of thing. Yeah. That was that was sort of like the the, the key pitch element. Um, so I took that and then I said, okay, so you are going to start there and you're going to end the game uh, dealing with the Battle of Hoover Dam, which is for control of the water and power in the New Vegas area. And I said, and that primarily is a conflict between the New California Republic and Caesar's Legion. And then I worked with um, I worked with John Gonzalez, who was our creative lead, to flesh out the greater story. And John is really responsible for fleshing out the characters, the sub-factions, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Mr. House developing those characters and writing most of those characters. And I wanted the player to feel like they would slowly get to know these different factions over the course of the early game before they really knew that they were going to be making a choice about <laughs> whom to choose from. So early on, you're just looking for Benny. And so I said, that's your goal is to find this guy, Benny. But your course through the Mojave Wasteland takes you past NCR, takes you past Caesar's Legion. It brings you into contact with groups like the Followers of the Apocalypse, all these other groups, and then eventually into contact with Mr. House. And then once you deal with Benny, now you're at the center of this conflict between all of these major factions. And you've seen enough of them that you maybe have some opinions about them and you can start to work with them. But I wanted the continuous sort of exposure to those factions over the course of the game to also change your expectations of who they were. I think a lot of people saw the NCR and thought, well, this is like America. This is like the good guys. But then the more they interacted with them, they saw like, this is pretty corrupt. There are some really petty people in control here. Um, this is a very dysfunctional government. Uh, and interacting with Caesar's Legion, initially they appear to be just completely psychotic. <laughs> But then they can learn that there is this very weird <clears throat> underlying philosophy to why Caesar is doing what he's doing. And for most people, that doesn't forgive Caesar's Legion for doing what it's doing, but it makes them more comprehensible, I think, to people. And really, in the end, I wanted your sort of choice to be one that really felt like you were kind of snaking between these different factions and going like, I don't know, like, maybe these guys will be good, but geez, I think maybe this is gonna work out badly for these folks, and I guess I could support Mr. House, but God, Mr. House wants me to destroy the Brotherhood of Steel, and I don't really think they need to be destroyed. And I wanted to put players in a situation where they were questioning their own values and their own morals and what they really wanted to see in the Capital Wasteland, or I'm sorry, the Mojave Wasteland. <laughs> so you mentioned in that, uh, that that you wanted to have players be making choices that paid off and changed the game in the long term. We hear, as players, we hear that from developers a lot. And sometimes, in fact, I say, most of the time, it doesn't usually end up in the same place, no matter what. You might mm -hmm. just take a slightly different path to get there. So as a gameplay designer, how do you actually do that? Like, yeah. how, how, what is the sort of process for making sure that that, that that actually comes true in a game when it's your goal? Well, you have, to, you have to plan for it. That's really important. You have to set, set certain ground rules uh, for the designers that they're not allowed to violate. Um, one of the ones in Fallout New Vegas that was really focused on player freedom, which this is sort of tangential to what you're talking about, but I think it goes Please. towards a larger point, is I said from the beginning, you have to be able to kill any character in this game who is not a child <laughs> um, as, soon as, as soon as you have a clear line of fire at them, basically. So I said, if you wanna open a door and have a character talk to someone, that's fine. But as soon as that conversation ends, you have to assume that the player has killed that character. You have to make your quest fail or move on or basically wrap up. It needs to be valid and viable, assuming that the character dies. And that went from even minor characters all the way up to Caesar and things like that. Um, and there are certain sacrifices you have to make to say like, there's going to be reactivity to this, but it has to be compartmentalized. And that's a really important thing. I think going all the way back to the early games I worked on, we had a lot of grand ambitions for these wildly diverging storylines. There are certainly RPGs that have tried doing this. I think Witcher 2 is kind of notable for, for having a really diverging storyline. Um, that's a ton of work <laughs> because you're essentially making a completely different critical path right. line. Um, and ultimately, I think you get less bang for your buck out of it. Really what we try to focus on is small scale reactivity, both immediately and then in the long run. So uh, one that I think we did a reasonably good job with in Fallout New Vegas that I like to refer to, which is a side quest, is one called 
uh, the whitewash. And it's a side quest where you're dealing with water being stolen from the NCR sharecroppers farm. And when you, you initially meet a farmer who says like, I can't make my quotas because I'm not being given the water that I'm supposed to uh, be given, what the hell is going on? Somewhere we're losing water. And it's this basically just a plot stolen from Chinatown. You, <laughs> you wave your right way through it and you eventually find out it's this guy uh, from the followers of the apocalypse or formerly from the followers of the apocalypse who is siphoning water off to help locals so that they can actually grow enough food to just survive. And he's like, look, I'm doing this. I'm not gonna apologize for it. Yeah, an NCR guy found out about it and I had to kill him to protect the secret. And that's what I had to do. And if you don't like it, then I guess you have to just deal with it. And a lot of players are like, well, I don't, like, I don't really want to cut off water to these people living in this area. So they're like, well, okay, dude, I guess your secret's safe, um, whatever. And then way later, we, we have a timer set so that way later, if you're wandering around the Mojave Wasteland near the sharecropper's farm, that farmer will come up to you and be like, hey, asshole, thanks for not figuring out what the, what the hell happened to the water. I got lost, lost my plot of land. I have to go back to California. Thanks for nothing. And it's like a, it's a small thing. It's actually very easy to do, but it's something where the player goes like, oh my God, like this is 10 hours later and yeah. there's this reactivity to this little thing that I did. And things like that, is if you plan for them and you really focus on like, it's very important that a quest has a long-term reaction, whether it's a character turning up in a different, like another one that I liked is uh, at Camp McCarran, there was a, uh, a guy named Little Buster. And he was just this, he's this like little dude in, in spiked armor and he's just an unarmed guy. And he, he did a couple of bounties before you start doing bounties. And he says, yeah, I already made all my money here. I'm gonna go to the strip and just make a fortune. See you later, man. And he leaves. And then later on, as you're going through the, um, sort of the free side area, which is pretty full of crime, uh, you just find his dead body. <laughs> and, and you're like, oh crap, this guy wound up getting jumped and, and killed. And uh, it's just stuff like that where it's just like, have a small payoff for these little choices and interactions that the player has, and it makes the world feel much more alive. It makes it feel like it grows and changes over time. It's not about planning for these epic things that diverge in massive ways. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I hate to dredge up the old topic of the Metacritic thing, the Metacritic bonus thing, but what, did you guys even know about it? Like as in the course of, development or was it just a thing that became a, a I don't, blew up later? I actually don't really know the full origins of that. It certainly wasn't a thing that I focused on during development. I think it just was a thing that blew up after the fact. Yeah, I could see that. I was just kind of curious. Um, you, you ended up releasing a mod for New Vegas that you made yourself mm -hmm. that was just that it was tailored to some specific preferences that, that you liked for the game. So I, so I have to ask like, if you're the lead designer on the game, how come that's not just an, an official patch? Well, because I believe design is about uh, needs and constraints. And ultimately, whether you're talking about designing a chair or you're designing a game, you have needs and constraints, and those are the things you have to deal with. Design is not, I mean, creativity is an element of it, but I'm not gonna buy a million copies of the game that I make. I have to think about the audience and what yeah. their sort of expectations are. Now, if I were making Van Buren for the audience that I was making Van Buren for, I would be making it for a different set of people and I would do different things with it. But the audience for Fallout New Vegas was primarily the audience for Fallout 3. Mm -hmm. And Fallout 3 was not a particularly challenging game. I mean, it's, it's not a hard game. It is a game that is, is relatively easygoing, it's relatively forgiving. So, for example, being able to jam stim packs, instant stim packs, <laughs> and carry an unlimited amount of them is, uh, is a design decision that is oriented towards allowing the player to really get out of almost any scrape as long as they have enough stim packs with them. And that's totally fine and totally valid. When making Fallout New Vegas, I realized I can't really err too far outside of the, the difficulty that's expected in this sort of a game. I mean, we did a little bit, but ultimately it kind of has to play like the game that, that came before it because that's the audience expectation. And there were certain choices where I was like, well, I could go this way or that way, but this way seems like it's more my own personal sensibility yeah. and a more hardcore sensibility. And I knew again that there were fans that would like that, but I knew that they were not probably the majority of fans. So uh, that's why I said like, I'm just gonna make a list of these things and then I'm gonna try to experiment with them. Cause that's the other thing is that I didn't wanna sort of experiment with stuff. 
on a very compressed timeline. Mm -hmm. Once the game was out and I saw a lot of feedback on it, I said like, okay, I'm gonna try to experiment with this stuff on my own, see how it plays knowing everything I know about the game now. And then at a certain point I was like, I'll just release it. And if there are people that are into it, that's cool. Yeah. And if not, I don't care. And I did establish a very, a very strict set of rules about how I developed the mod. I'm not gonna change things because people ask me to change them. <laughs> like yeah, It was your thing. It's, it's my thing. If you don't like it, don't download it. Um, <laughs> Uh, because of the sort of complexity of how the data interacts in that engine, I said it requires every single piece of DLC, including Gunrunner's Arsenal and all the other things. And if you don't like it, then you don't have to get it. And people were like, well, could you make versions that don't require them? No, <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm doing this to make one cohesive thing and it's specifically for the tastes that I think are good and enjoy. And if other people want to play that, that's cool. If you don't, there are literally hundreds of great, amazing mods that go way beyond the sort of stuff that I do that are incredible overhauls that add new content, all sorts of stuff. Mine was, and I, I refuse to call it a director's cut because it was not a director's cut. It was just my personal sort of thing. Yeah. That's why, and I just called it Jay Sawyer because at Obsidian, our naming convention when we save things locally, uh, when working in that editor is just first initial last name. So it's really, that's just the way that I worked at Obsidian. And when I went home, I saved out that as Jay Sawyer. And so the mod is Jay Sawyer. I didn't want it, I didn't want to make it out to be anything more than it was, just my personal thing. Nice. Uh, would you ever want to do another Fallout game? Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Because uh, to me, like as a, as somebody who just sort of covers the industry, but I'm not a developer or, or a publisher, certainly, it's... To, I don't understand why Bethesda hasn't called Obsidian to, to want to do another. I mean, yes, I know you guys have your own IP now in, in Pillars of Eternity, but uh, it, boy, it sure seemed like that uh, New Vegas was very successful, both critically and commercially. Why wouldn't Bethesda want to do an off-year game with you guys again? I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's up to them. So yeah. Certainly. Um, all right. So... I wanted to ask, I want to move now to the, uh, we're getting to Pillars of Eternity, I, cool. I assure you. Yes, oh, we, I know you're not here about for whatever. your health. Yeah, we've, got, <laughs> we've got a new game to promote, but uh, you're the project director and lead designer on the Aliens RPG yep. that eventually got canceled by Sega. Uh, Fergus was in here, he, he was talking some about that, but does that one, does that one hurt too? The, oh yeah, I mean, any of the projects that got canceled hurt. I mean, the... I would say the thing is that the vast majority of game developers really love what they do. They really love the things, the projects they get to work on, uh, whether it's creating their own worlds and settings and characters or adapting the settings and worlds and characters of an existing intellectual property. Yeah. Uh, we're very passionate about what we do and we put literally years of our lives into developing these things. And maybe if we're lucky, on the short end, we work on a project for six months and it gets canceled. That's still half a year of your life that's gone. So that's kind of a bummer when, it, when it's something that is a year and a half, two years, two and a half years, that is very frustrating because by that point in time, you've really put a big chunk of, of time and experience into it. It's also tragic in some ways for junior developers because I have actually met developers who wind up working on, let's say, three games that get canceled in a row, and they've been in the industry maybe six or seven years, and they've never finaled a game. Nothing on the resume. And they have shipped. not, yeah, the nothing shipped, which is it's really bad because both for for two reasons. One is that the experience of shipping a game is very different from the sh uh, experience of making a game. Finaling a game is its own beast of a thing that's very important to understand. You have to make a lot of very critical decisions in the last few months that you don't have to make earlier in development. And the other, so it's bad for them developing professionally. <clears throat> and I would say it's also bad because their resume doesn't look good, so. Yeah, the uh, Fergus, like I said, he was in here talking a little bit about, about Aliens, but boy, it sure looked like that if it, if it had made it to the end, I mean, it, it was gonna be unlike any other Aliens video game that had ever been made before. Yeah, I think that a lot of people, when it was announced that we were working on an Aliens role-playing game, a lot of people literally couldn't even comprehend it, which seems crazy to me. It seemed like a great fit. As soon as I heard about it, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see it now. I can see exactly how it can be, and it can be a really fun, cool game. Um, but there are a lot of people who are like, that just doesn't even make any sense. I think partially it was, I can't remember when, when we started working on it relative to Mass Effect, but sci-fi games as RPGs were not, 
necessarily a super big thing outside of Mass Effect at the very least. And specifically the Aliens franchise, people just didn't comprehend like how can that possibly be a role playing <laughs> game. And so I think there was a struggle there, uh, at least in communicating it to people. But I always thought that the nature of the stories in the Aliens franchise were really about people interacting more than like in all these movies, it's about more than just Ripley. It's about Ripley in the midst of a group of people and her sort of emerging as this, you know, sort of de facto leader, the person who has to help pull them through. Yeah. And it's about how people either fall apart or they rise up. And those are beautiful character arcs, whether you're talking about the crew of the Nostromo, this very small crew of, uh, of people that are dealing with this, you know, threat that they can't possibly sort of comprehend and deal with, or you're looking at James Cameron's, you know, colonial Marines and characters like Burke and seeing how those characters change over time. And really for me in a role-playing game, those are the great sort of key things to those key relationships that you can build. And that's what I really wanted to emphasize in the Aliens game we were making. Did, uh, so did, did you guys pitch it to Sega or did they come to you and say, hey, we want something a little different in the, with the Aliens IP? I'm curious how that I think I think it was, I, I can't remember the exact sequence of events, but I think we were already working on Alpha Protocol. That's, I was gonna mention that. And yeah. they, they had the Aliens IP and they wanted pitches. And I didn't write the initial pitch. I believe Travis Stout wrote the initial pitch at that point, I think it was called like Aliens Allmire or something like that. And uh, they were interested in it. And then I you know, came on as the, as the director and started shaping where it was going. And yeah. Man, it's a, I would have loved to have seen that game. Some, some sort of you know, prototype in development footage has since hit YouTube. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of uh, sad because, actually I shouldn't say that I came on as the project director. More properly, I came on as the lead designer. We didn't have directors uh, at that time at Obsidian, and it only was at the sort of very tail end of the project that I came on as director, um, in part because of some of the dysfunction we were seeing on the project. Um, the structure of Obsidian prior to that was that we didn't have individual directors. We had leads of each discipline, and then we had an executive producer. The executive producer was mostly responsible for keeping things on schedule but there wasn't a single person that could just make decisions. Uh -huh. So for example, if, <laughs> if programming wanted to do something and design didn't want it, you know, there was kind of this back and forth and it could get sort of stymied and not go anywhere. And the same as like design wants something and animation doesn't think it's worth doing. It doesn't necessarily get done. And uh, at the tail end of Aliens, we were seeing that things were just really having a difficult time coming together. And we had lots of ideas and we had lots of stuff um, but I said, I think, I think we need to have directors on projects who are capable of making final decisions when they're contentious. Um, obviously, no one likes being overruled, but if our goal is to be, you know, really having a vision and a direction to go in, that's something that we need to do. Was the, so would, was the Aliens game on track and, you know, there, it was a publisher decision or, or was there was there some trouble on the dev no side? There, there was trouble on the development side I I, I, I there's some quote from Fergus where he said it, he felt like it, it played like a finished game it did not play like a finished game um, there were there were a lot of problems with area development specifically that was a big a big problem uh, we had some animation problems that we were working through and yeah I mean it, it still had a lot of issues like I said there was a lot there's a lot of cool stuff in it but ultimately we weren't building our areas at a fast enough pace and there were just some lingering problems though. So even though I was very disappointed by its cancellation, um, especially because I believe in the last few months we really did, here's the thing that really bums me out is that the footage, the footage that people see on YouTube is yeah. actually not the last milestone that we did. Um, we actually did one or two milestones after that where it got much better looking. Mm -hmm. And it was too little too late, honestly. So like I said, even though I was really disappointed that it got canceled, I, I get why it was canceled. You, you did see it coming, it didn't blind No, you. I wasn't like, whoa, where did this come from? Because it, it, it we had taken a long time to make a, a very small part of the game. So I got it. Um, so it was your idea to take Pillars of Eternity to Kickstarter. Uh, or at least you're credited with it. Um, I'm credited with it, and I don't really like that because there are a lot of other people that deserve credit right, for this so as well. We, that's good. We can get you here in a second. Yeah, and I've said it straight, but people keep ignoring <laughs> it. So, so the first person to really, I think, talk about 
crowdfunding seriously at Obsidian was Nathaniel Chapman. And he was a, he's a great designer I worked with for many years at Obsidian. He later went to Blizzard to work on World of Warcraft, where he still is. Um, but he, I think, was one of the first guys who was like, could we even like just crowdfund a game? Could we use Kickstarter to crowdfund a game? And I think that idea got a lot of people inspired. It got Adam Brennecke inspired. It got a lot of people at the studio really jazzed about the possibility. But we weren't really sure that it could be done, period, until Double Fine Adventure. I was just going to ask you about <clears throat> that. So Double Fine Adventure happened, and we were looking at each other. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, no worries. Yeah, I was going to ask you, and you can get, maybe uh, work that in after this, if, if you, uh, you slash the team ended up <clears throat> speaking to Tim Schafer and Double Fine at all to sort of gauge their experience with it before you guys set off uh, on your, your <clears throat> Kickstarter and own a Kickstarter adventure. So I don't know how, I mean, I didn't personally talk to Tim or anyone, uh, Fergus may have, yeah. but we talked to them about, I'm sorry, we saw the success that Double Fine Adventure had and we said like, we got to do this because this was after, this was in the wake of actually the Microsoft project being canceled. We had a huge layoff after that. Morale of the company was extremely low yeah. and you know, we were working on pitches for other publishers. Well, and you guys had been, I talked to Fergus about this, you guys had been maybe one of the unluckiest <laughs> developers I know. You've been burned by so many different publishers. If Maybe not, it's not necessarily always the publisher's sure. fault, but between Sega and THQ and, uh, and Microsoft, it's like, I could see how all of a sudden, like, not having a publisher might be really appealing. Well, and that was the thing because it was it. The thing that gets really frustrating when you're an independent developer and you don't have a lot of cash in the bank is that you have very little leverage with publishers. The publishers have money, and they can be very patient, and they have a lot of people trying to make games with them, and they can wait you out. They can starve you out, basically. They can negotiate terms that are extremely unfavorable if they want to. Why wouldn't they? That's like the whole. That's how they make the most profits. So. You know, no matter what a publisher says, they're not in this to make developers rich. They're in it to make the publisher rich. And they'll fund you to get rich, but beyond that, if you don't have leverage, you're in big trouble. Um, and one of the things I remember hearing about a long time ago is uh, I actually interviewed many, many, many years ago at Ensemble, rest in peace. And on, uh, one of the things that I had learned is that during the development of Age of Empires, they retained control of the Age of Empires license. And that was extremely good leverage moving into Age of Empires 2, working with Microsoft. But it, it was this really mind-blowing contrast to working as an independent studio where you do not have the cash to just wait out a publisher and, and go to other publishers and negotiate and make them sort of try to bid for, for your sure. attention. So going all the way back to Kickstarter, then looking at that as a platform where we are beholden to the fans who are backing us, and that's it, was extremely appealing. Because at the time, we were in a desperate situation. We're pitching things to publishers, publishers who know that we just had a huge layoff. They know that they can get their way with us. Yeah, they if they can over just, a barrel. They just have us over a barrel. And um, so there was, there was this there was this great energy at the company for doing uh, a crowdfunding project. And it was something the owners were not actually really enthusiastic about to begin with. <laughs> um, and they really needed to be convinced um, strongly that it, we needed to do it. So uh, once we got the go ahead to do it, I wasn't initially working on it. I was working on other pitches, but Adam Brennecke started really driving forward with ideas for a crowdfunding campaign. But then, uh, you know, you, you talked about earlier in this interview about how the, the market for sort of uh, old school CRPGs never went away, just the publishers did. Yeah. So uh, was that the obvious thing to go back to uh, when you remove the publisher from the equation is, well, let's make, let's, let's tap into that audience that's, that publishers aren't serving? Very much so. I mean, because the thing is, it's not like we hadn't ever brought up the idea of making a game like this with publishers but they literally had no interest in it. It was just like, you're looking at an ROI that is just not a return on investment. That's really just not interesting to us. Yeah. Like they, they, wanna, they wanna spend tens of millions of dollars on a game to you know, make hundreds of millions of dollars in profit. And they wanna have a huge team. And that's kind of the MO of publishers in that, in that sort of uh, 
mid 2000s to, you know, through 2012, that's their whole vibe. And again, I knew that there were still fans out that out there that were interested in these games and I wasn't sure that they would crowdfund us. I mean, even, and we've said this a lot, but going into the actual funding phase, I thought there was a 50-50 chance we would be funded for our $1.1 million target. Even with Obsidian's track record? Yes, yes. Because again, I knew there were fans out there, but this goes beyond simple fandom. Like people were giving thousands of dollars to us for backer rewards and all these things, and it was just purely out of passion and love for this type of game. And I don't think we can ever, I don't think anyone can ever take their fans' love and, and trust for granted. You have to continually reward their trust to continue to earn it in the future. Sure. And so with, with Pillars of Eternity, I was like, or at the time Project Eternity, I was like, I hope that people are into this. I, I think that they will be. Um, how much money will they give? I don't know. But I was like, yeah, 50-50 chance that we get funded by the end of the month. <laughs> and of course it was 27 hours before we hit 1.1 million. And in the end, I think we raised 3.9 during the initial funding phase and then four point something yeah. afterwards. So. so uh What's, what's the biggest change then uh, within the studio from having a publisher to not having one? Is it purely morale based or are there other, uh, does it free you up design wise? What are some of the other effects? It does free you up design wise or rather it trades one set of design constraints for another set of design constraints. Um, design constraints from publishers are often oriented towards the widest possible market and which is fair, <laughs> but not, that's a set of constraints that you can work with. I mean, that's a set of constraints that I worked with for Fallout New Vegas. Uh, when we make games for hardcore fans of party-based, isometric, real-time with pause games, there's a different set of constraints. In some ways, it's much more constraining, <laughs> but it's also, it's, I guess the thing is, what the publisher wants is not necessarily what the players want, or it's, it's more oriented towards a specific subset of that market. Yeah. And with, uh, with Kickstarter and crowdfunding, being able to go directly to the fans, tell them your ideas really early, hear them say that they're crap, <laughs> revise them, hear them say that they're still crap, revise them again, have them say, oh, that's okay. That, that, that as an experience is, is much healthier, I think, than designing things in secret because the publisher isn't ready to talk to the public about the game and then kind of question it back and forth with the publisher, have the publisher second guess what you're doing. Then the last six months of the game have this very tight messaging campaign where you can't talk about all these like niche things that you really want to get feedback on. Then the game comes out and the players go like, man, I don't like any of this stuff. And it's like, well, that's, that's not a fun way to make a game. That doesn't, that doesn't really help anyone. It just helps the publisher focus a message for a mass market. Yeah. And so it's, um, I would rather have those cons the constraints of the player base, which like I said, are in, in many ways more restrictive than trying to you know, arc them through the publisher's expectations and then hope that you land somewhere in an area that the players like. Uh, speaking of constraints, were there any issues with uh, trying to stay within the, the, the crowdfunding budget? Does, oh yeah, that, I mean we that... didn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. Um, Do you have investors that jump in after you get a Kickstarter success like that, or? Um, I mean, so we did have continuous funding after the the crowdfunding campaign was over because we still had a PayPal account open yeah. and, and a few other things, and you know the studio has multiple projects going on concurrently, so there was also some potential. There was some funding uh, from elsewhere that came in, and then I also believe that pre-orders outside of the initial crowdfunding campaign also brought, brought money in. So there are a number of different sources of revenue and that's the sort of thing, honestly, where I'm like, very glad that Fergus does that because I don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> but for, Fergus is really like, he's responsible for keeping the company running. He's responsible for making sure that we get our paychecks and the lights stay on and all that stuff. So um, they made it work. And it basically like, once we realized that the game was in a state where it was pretty good, but it needed more. It needed more time and polish. Uh, you know, the owner said like, okay, well, we don't really want to spend more money on this, but it's important to spend more money. You, know, you don't want to ever spend more money on something <laughs> than you need to. But they looked at it and they're like, this is, this is approaching something that's going to be really good, um, but we want to make it great. Let's take a few more months, leave it in development. We'll work, we'll work around it and we'll make sure that it comes out in the best state that it can. Did, uh, 
did it exceed expectations uh, as far as sales wise when it when it when it shipped or I will say that I did not personally have any particular sales expectations um, in terms of critical reception I, I think it exceeded our expectations um, I do think that people there was a lot of nostalgia love that sort of lifted our Metacritic up <laughs> a little higher because um, it still had some rough spots when it launched and I think you know our fans criticized things that they were you know deserved in, in, in criticizing but uh, I am glad that it was critically well received and that it did sell well and continues to sell well. You know, to date, it sold over a million units, wow. which is for a game of this size is is very good because it allows us to continue funding more stuff in the future. Such as uh, Pillars, of, Pillars Eternity of Eternity Two, Two Deadfire, Deadfire coming soon. Uh, which actually, by the time this interview airs, it will be out. Oh, great! So barring, say barring whatever a, I want. Another <laughs> last minute delay, I guess. But uh, but yeah, like had, had you had you ever even thought about this as a, as a universe, as a, as a thing that would be more than one game? Definitely. Yeah? From the beginning. That might sound sort of uh, opportunistic, but here's the thing, like going back and looking at, going back all the way to my experience of thinking about Ensemble and their experiences with Age of Empires is that they had created something that was their own intellectual property. And that is so incredibly valuable. Because what is a game company? A game company are the people who work for it and the passion that they bring to what they do. It's IPs. It's, it's, it's hardware, which is worth virtually nothing, and it's intellectual properties. And nothing adds value to a company, a game company, like it's in terms of real money, like it's IPs. Because employees, no matter what they contribute, they're free to go. They can move on, they can leave the industry, they can do whatever they want. You can't count on that being part of the company. You, you can't take your employees for granted. Um, IPs are the things that the company owns and they can keep using for a variety of purposes over time. And I know that there are certain types of games that would work very well with this type of setting that are not pillars. I mean, they're not like literally the Pillars of Eternity party-based isometric. We could make a turn-based tactics game. We could make a first-person sort of Elder Scroll style game. Like there's all sorts of stuff that we could do with the setting. I'm developing a crazy tabletop role-playing game going all the way back to my roots. Uh, for Pillars of Eternity. And when I conceived it, I said, this needs to be something that we can use as a company to build in the future. And it wasn't that I had a whole plot arc worked out, but there is a sort of, I did, when we were talking about the plot for Pillars of Eternity, I said, it should feel epic, but not too epic. <laughs> it should feel like you are an ordinary person that gets caught up in really extraordinary things and you get a glimpse of these really crazy supernatural forces that are, are just outside of the realm of sort of mortal understanding. Uh, so that we could make a sequel and that sequel would raise the stakes. And now you're more integral to these conflicts that are going on and you're seeing this all this stuff going on across the world. Um, but yeah, it was conceived from the beginning as a thing that would be ours to own and grow to the extent that also I, as an individual designer, I try not to design outside of the boundaries of what we're actually putting in the games because I want other teams and other designers or heck, maybe someone would license this yeah, from us. Another right. developer might, you know, for example, let's say that tactics game, I really want to make that tactics game, <laughs> but let's say we weren't able to make it for one reason or other. It just didn't fit with us. Maybe another company could license the Pillars of Eternity uh, franchise from us. Maybe they could even use our technology as a starting point and they could develop that. That would be great for everybody. So it expands that universe. It gives the fans more games to play in that setting. And it's ultimately like more profitable for the company. So what's uh, with, with Pillars 2 out now, what, what's uh, next for you? What's next for the company? I'm not looking for you to announce any yeah. projects, but you know, do you, do you stay, uh, stay in house as far as the, the Pillars IP goes? Do you, know, do you wanna try and, do you wanna take a break, maybe do something a little different than Pillars? I'm, I'm just kinda curious where, where you're hoping to see things go from here. Yeah, I mean, as far as the Pillars of Eternity franchise, I really do wanna see us as a company continue to develop it in new ways. Um, I want to keep making games like this that are really focused on the more hardcore fans, the more hardcore crowd. But I also think there's great opportunities for us to make more mainstream games with that. Um, personally, I want to work on something different <laughs> because I've been working on Pillars for six years now, wow. which is kind of a while. I mean, it's nothing compared to people who work on MMOs, but um, I mean, I have made a lot of party-based fantasy role-playing games. They're a lot of fun to make, but I am burned out <laughs> for now on this. And I have other game ideas that are, are actually even smaller in scope than something like a Pillars of Eternity or a Deadfire that I would like to explore. But in the immediate future, 
I am the design director of the whole company and we do have other projects that are going on that I need to give more attention to. So hopefully in the immediate future, probably for the next year or so, I'm just going to be focused on helping other designers at Obsidian just you know improve in their craft and uh, make all of our games just a little bit better from a design perspective. Awesome. Well, uh, Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire is out now as you see this. Uh, Josh Sawyer, thank you so much for stopping by. This was a, a really fascinating interview. I always I always love hearing, uh, you know, I, I, I was a big PC gamer growing up uh, and, and played a, a whole whole bunch of your games. So it's, I always love hearing the sort of how you got here kind of story. So thank you so much. Thank uh, you very much for having me. Great. And for more on the best, brightest, and most notable minds in the games industry, stay tuned for new episodes of IGN Unfiltered every month.